Awesome. <laughs> yeah, so I'm recording um, and I'm going to hand things over to you, Allison. Thanks for joining us to show us all Editoria. Yeah, thanks. And thank you for having me. It's a pleasure uh, to talk with you and to show you Editoria. Um, so just one thing that's funky on my end is that for some reason, my, uh, my main Wi-Fi is kicked out today. So I'm running this off my personal hotspot on my phone. So I think it will be fine. I've done this before, oddly enough, but um, just so you know, uh, if, if anything gets weird. Anyhow, um, so I will actually stop my video too to preserve some bandwidth for you. And uh, I will share my screen. And so you should see yourselves for a brief moment. And then you should see edit. Uh, does everybody see? Yeah. Head yeah. nods. Yep. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so Karen, just, uh, I see you're muted, so maybe you just want me to get straight into it, but I was going to ask, is there any need to do introductions, or do you think we just, we jump right into the platform? Um, well, as you know, this is our advisory group, and we have all been in the same room together with Adam, um, okay. working on a prototype for an authoring tool. Yep. So, um, there's a variety of librarians here, people who've worked on open textbook projects, as well as faculty authors who've written books. Okay. Um, I, will, I invite anyone who'd like to introduce themselves to do so in the chat. Otherwise, I think we're good to jump in. Okay, fantastic. So you are looking at Editoria uh, right now on my screen, and this is uh, what you call the book dashboard. In Editoria, this is the home screen for anybody who has a uh, user identity in Editoria. So um, in terms of creating your own account, uh, Editoria is similar to many of the platform tools that you use. You create uh, a username, which is you know, tied to your email address. You create a password, and then you're in. And this is, uh, this is the spot where you come to when you, when you perform that login. Now, in terms of your user profile, um, from the top of the page here, you can always click on user profile and you can update uh, or change any of the information that you've stored on yourself. So this includes um, your name, your, your sort of long form name, which is used further on in the system in terms of searching for um, people to perform key roles. So it is uh, important to add your name here. Um, you can update your username as well as to change your password. So that's a nice little security feature that we have. Um, and then I can always, again, come back to my book dashboard. So the book dashboard works like this. So for every person in Editoria, of course, they're a user. And then they are associated to specific books. And their association to each book uh, is based on the function that they are assigned within the book. So in other words, I'm not always any one role in Editoria. I'm, I'm just a user and then whoever is sort of um, the production editor role really would determine what I do on each book. And until they associate me with a book and a role within the book, no books will show up on my dashboard. So the books you see here are only books that that this admin, for example, has access to. So that's just, and we'll get more into roles uh, later, I think. But um, for example, um, you know, because I'm an admin and I'm in an, as an admin, I can do uh, specific things like edit books that exist uh, within my remit. I can rename them, which again is a higher level permission. Um, as well as to archive them. And I'll show you what that is in one moment. So editing a book is something that anybody associated with it can do. That basically just takes you into the deeper level, into the book builder, and allows you to start actioning on, you know, role-based tasks within a book. Um, so that's to say that copy editors and authors would all see the same edit button. What, what they wouldn't see is, for example, the ability to rename the book. That's a, within the post-acquisition workflow, which is the workflow that we're showing today, which is sort of the out-of-the-box version of Editoria. Um, not everybody you know, has equal permissions, and so functions like renaming a book are reserved for the higher levels of permissions. Um, and the same is true of archiving. So in terms of what I, what I can do um, within the UI on the book dashboard, I can always um, decide how I want to view the distribution of titles here. I can view them alphabetically by author. 
alphabetically by title or by status. And you might have guessed that in, in editorial, there are only two statuses, right? So many of these books are in progress. That's one of the statuses, means production is ongoing. And then the other one is published. And so what this means is that there's a date associated with this book and that that date has passed. Um, I also wanna point out that that date is always editable so that if editable, if at the beginning of your project you say, well, I know I'm going to have to publish this by May 30th, and then, you know, May 30th comes and goes, and it's just not done. You can always go in and make that change so that this isn't misleading. Um, but, you know, um, that's just to say this is how that status change is triggered. Um, and so then with any of these, regardless of how you're looking at your books, you can always, um, you know, reverse the sort order. So if you're looking A to Z, you can go Z to A and so on. And then um, just to show you the archived functionality. So if I click this toggle, you now see many more books. And so the reason that they didn't show up at first is obviously because this is a lot of noise. You know, it might be an older deployment. There may have been many books that have already been put through. And so it makes sense to be able to clear them away, but not delete them. It, it may be that I plan to do a future edition and leverage these files. There are many reasons why I may want them kicking around. Um, however, if I truly don't, from within the archive stage, I can delete them. And that really will clear it out of my deployment. I never have to think about it again. Uh, however, it could be that maybe a project was on hold and I pushed it into archive so I didn't have to see it every day, but now I wish to unarchive it. So that's also a possibility once something is within archive. You may remember that when we were uh, out, you know, when we had filtered out the archive, those options don't even show up here. Um, so, so that's just uh, a note about the archive, which is, again, this is a higher level permissions uh, element that wouldn't even show up to, say, a copy editor. And in that same vein, there's something called uh, Global Teams. And when I, when I click on it what, it, what this screen is asking me to do is to identify people who should be automatically associated with any new books that I create. So if, uh, you know, for example, I know that Emma and Karen will always need to be associated with every single book created in this deployment, I would just add them here. And then um, I don't even need to, at the book level, make those associations. So they always have the highest level permissions. It happens right away upon book creation. Um, and you don't have to use this. I mean, it, it may well be the use case that, you know, the teams are completely separate for every single book. But um, just in the event that you did have sort of a team that were really responsible for, you know, the highest level of every single book, this would be the place to set it and forget it. So now I'm going to come back to the book dashboard and um, why don't we add a book? So... I'm, I'm adding a book now. You'll see it populate on the menu. There we go. Okay, so you'll see that it, it is now showing up and then to actually start building this book, I'm going to click on edit. And here we are at the book builder. So this is the place where everything's going to come together. And you can actually see the skeleton of a book kind of already exists. Like you can see, we have an area where the front matter will take shape. We have body, we have back matter. We have um, this sort of pre-created uh, table of contents component, which I did nothing to do. This is default for all books. And, and we'll look at that in greater detail in a moment. Um, and so there are also sort of options showing up along the UI here. So let's talk through those. So, Within Editoria, we talked about the post acquisition workflow. This is the workflow university presses typically follow. And um, many of the functions of Editoria, as you see it today in this demo, follow that workflow. However, uh, Book Sprints, which is a community member, um, several library publishers, including your group, we know that your requirements are different. Um, we know that that whole acquisitions piece isn't really part of the picture. Sure, and that in fact what you may like to do is to do the authoring in the tool. However, let's set that aside for one second. Um, this upload word files is a bulk upload of post acquisition word files. And that's what I'll show you today. But first I just want to show you that you can always do this. You can always add chapters one by one and authors, anybody can come in and start writing. 
And this is right in the web-based word processor. This is, for all intents and purposes, your Word or DocX or Google Docs replacement, if you want it to be. And so we can, we can come back and take a look at this in one moment. I'm just actually um, gonna go back to the book. Uh, we'll talk through the nav and then we'll, we'll show you um, sort of the, the workflow. So team manager. Now this is sort of like the child, you could think of it, of uh, global teams. So global teams, we were setting one person to be on all the books. Team manager is a place where you can set uh, the individual contributors in each role at the individual book level. So it functions the same way as the team manager and that I can just start searching for someone. Of course. Uh... <laughs> um... Okay, so I'm not familiar with everyone in this deployment. Oh, here we go. So you can see as I type, I just need a couple of letters and any of the users. This is pulling directly from the user profile. These are the names that were entered against these usernames. So I just need to search for people I know should be in my deployment and they'll pop right up. And I can just go ahead and associate people that way. And so again, I'm giving Juan the uh, production editor um, responsibilities and capabilities I would be adding a copy editor function if I if I do this and so this is a lower level of permissions and then um, the same is true if I add authors now authors are pretty heavily um, gated within this deployment within a university press style workflow and again we know that isn't necessarily the case in library publishing workflows and in fact the organization Atla Open Press has worked with Editoria a bunch, and so we do have good requirements from them specific to, you know, what, where are the areas of this type of deployment that you needed workarounds for in terms of permissions? Because there are a lot of things that they wanted their authors to be able to do that university presses would never <laughs> want their authors to do. So this, you know, and, and again, all of the permissions, it's a module in PubSuite, so it's very flexible, it can be changed, it's just that this is sort of the out of the box or vanilla version. So um, setting team manager aside, we have metadata capture. So this is a form where I can manually enter metadata about the book. Now, a couple of versions ago, ago in Editoria, maybe a year ago, we didn't yet have this. We didn't have any way to store or export metadata for the books. This was a first pass and it was released again, maybe a little bit less than a year ago. Um, as a first iteration to be able to surface, you know, capture some high level fields, but we know that there needs to be more metadata capture. We know that this is at a book level. And for example, there's probably a bunch of chapter level metadata, especially on OER stuff that you would want to be capturing. So um, this is an area where I would fully expect that the community will define further requirements and um, the updates will be made. So, um, you can see though, today we do have the ability to enter an ISBN, we can enter the pub date, and that's what drives that flag that will change the status on the book dashboard that I pointed out to you. We can define a copyright holder, edition number, and so on. And so then um, these two are to do with export, and we're going to get there, but first I want to start building the book with you. So, the most common use case, right, is that I'm going to, or I shouldn't say common, but with the vanilla version, it, it is uh, definitely built around the idea that you're going to be loading post-acquisition Word files. So when I do this, I find my files, I select them all, and I um, give it a little minute. Because you can see here, well, and also because I'm doing it on a <laughs> cell phone, <laughs> internet connectivity, so let's see how this goes. But um, so it says right here that we're converting 12 files. So what that means is for these 12 files, the docx uh, is being extracted and converted to HTML. And when we start to see these chapter uh, documents loading into the UI, and they kind of come alive in, in a visual way that you'll see, um, that's when we know that they're available to be edited within the web-based word processor. That being said, again, for your particular use case, it may well be that you're not doing that and you're adding the chapters and parts and so on uh, this way because you're going to be actually working with authors to write them directly in the system. And that's 
that's awesome. That's really exciting. Um, so now I'm just waiting. Okay, here we go. That is a win for Verizon right there. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can see that the TOC is really starting to populate and there are many more files still coming through, but they will. And so this is what I mean by come alive, right? You have some color here and that just means I can click on it. I can go right into the web-based word processor and start uh, doing my thing. So as we wait for the others to finish, I'm just going to point out a few other things about this area of the book builder. So um, next to each uh, component, you can see these three dots, which again, don't come alive until I mouse over them. And when I do, that's how I can move things. So I can always move uh, any of the components between sections. So if I want to drag something from up in the front matter to the body, I do it. I can always drag you know, something else, so on. There's no limit to what I can move around, which is, which is um, really useful here. Now, the second element that you see next to each component is this cog. And so when I click on the cog, it's telling me all of the preset component types that I could identify this particular component to be. So it could be an introduction, it could be a preface, it could be a half title, it could be a title page, and so on. The reason why um, this is important is because um, it has to do with export. So there's all kinds of like styling and CSS related stuff that relies on knowing what kind of a component uh, the individual component is. And based on what section of the book builder the component is showing up in, that drives what options are available within this menu. For example, if I come down to body and I show you what components are available, we have chapter, part, and unnumbered, as well as uh, a custom made uh, element or component type called images. So that is uh, to say that you can also add your own uh, component types. And that's a newer development in Editoria, but it's really important because obviously um, having a vanilla version and having multiple organizations use it, everybody calls different by different things, is interested in, it, in making different styles available, for example, within the web-based word processor that's tied to each of these components. So this really gives editor a lot of flexibility, and you'll see this when we start to look at the web-based word processor. Um, so this here, this governs whether or not the component shows up in the auto-generated TOC up here. So if I um, if I click this. It is in, see it says TOC, and then when I put the slash through it, that means it's not. So, um, so that before there was uh, more or less like uh, no way to keep something out of the table of contents, but of course things like title page and the actual TOC don't need to be listed on the TOC. And since the TOC auto generates at export, we need to give it these rules if we want it to be really useful. Um, okay, so just a couple more notes about, you know, what's going on in the book builder UI. For every component, you can always head in and edit. That brings you to the web-based word processor. You can delete. Uh, you can set the page break, whether it's going to need to begin on a left or right page or whether it's even a spread. You can um, make those designations in the system. And um, that is going to help when you push toward pagination at, at export. And so below each component, you can see you, you do have this button to upload your individual Word file. That's how if you didn't work in bulk or say that you, you did a bulk upload, but then you had you know, an index that came in late, you would create the component and then you would upload the Word document into it unless you were going to you know, go in and author directly, as we've mentioned. And so next to that, every time I mouse over above this line, you see all these production steps showing up. So these are the stages of, uh, you know, the life cycle of a chapter as identified by the university presses and that post acquisition workflow. I'm not sure if they align with a workflow that would make sense for you. So I won't spend a ton of time talking about them aside to say that every time that I, uh, for example, update a step, I get a pop-up notification that's telling me exactly what I'm doing because this mechanism allows me to gate workflow based on rules and permissions. So, you know, copy editors are now going to be able to come into this chapter if I move forward 
And so that's, for me, that's news because as of right now, only, only production editors would be able to access it. Everybody else could see a view only, but they couldn't you know, go in and make edits or anything like that. And the same is true as you roll further down the line, there's a stage, for example, where copy editors can no longer make edits. And so once you roll forward into that stage, you just, you have this pop-up that's just telling you what you're doing um, so that, you know, you're not accidentally putting it in a state that you didn't expect in terms of access. Um, again, not sure if that's super important to your workflow, but uh, it, it's part of this permissions module that's active within the vanilla version. And I imagine, you know, there's, there's endless possibilities in terms of creating something that works, you know, for, for other workflows. Allison, I think that there is a lot there that applies in terms of gate, gatekeeping for that workflow, I think is really pretty exciting. And yeah. I have not seen Editoria in a while. And I just want to say, wow, since the last community meeting where I remember seeing it, there is so much more here that's been developed. And I oh, just, awesome. yeah, I just wanted to pause and see if anyone out there um, had any questions that were piling up or wanted um, to clarify anything that you've shown so far. I know I would like, to, um, before you're finished today, I would like to take just a little bit of a closer look at that web-based word processor. I'm sure it's um, familiar to many of us, but I think that might be of interest um, for those of us who want to learn more about writing in the tool. But I'm going to just pause for a moment to see if there's anyone who would like to unmute and ask a question. Yeah, this is Emma. I have a quick question. Great. Um, Allison, in relation to the files that can be uploaded, um, so d you, were, you were talking specifically about Microsoft Word, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, and those are like um, .doc or .x or does that not, does that not matter? It does matter. So that's okay. a really good question, Emma. Um, so the, in order for the um, conversion to be able to function appropriately, you need to upload docx files today. So dot doc wouldn't work. Sure. And then are there other, um, are there any other like formatting or character limitations um, that, you know, like I, Word has some funky formatting that you can do based on like the different version that you're working in. So are there any limitations as far as what is in your Word document? So, yeah, I would say there are in terms of the expectation for what will convert and how. Um, so, for example, just, just to use a random example here, if you had a Word doc that had tables embedded, I wouldn't expect those tables to come in to, in today's version. Um, I don't think that's a going to be a constant state, but the way that I would recommend, like, for example, tables to be placed in Editoria based on this version today would be that you'd have to pull them in as an image. And like that has to happen from, you know, you upload the Word doc, it will ignore the table that you have embedded probably. And then separately within the web-based word processor in Editoria, you would place the image of the table. Uh, into your editorial or wax document at that point. Um, and the same is probably true of images, right? So if I have um, some images, maybe JPEGs or whatever that I dragged into Word, I placed them exactly where I wanted them, they will not come in to editorial today. Um, and, and in terms of limitations on what I can uh, do for uploading images to editorial in wax to play, be placed directly. And we can take a look at this. I'll go through wax really um, in, a, in a pretty granular way, but um, I would need to have JPEGs or SVG files uh, to, to place. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, no, thank you, it is a great question. And just one other small note, I am I know that MathML is here and I know that it's quite powerful, but um, I've heard, you know, some really, really heavy math, you may have to, um, I don't know whether you need to use the diacritics tool that's within the, um, or the special characters tool that's within the web-based word processor, um, but just to say we don't have, say, like an equation editor or anything like that. Hey, Allison, this is Carla. Um, a quick question. Um, did you just say that tables are brought in as images? Today, they are. And um, when we look at the web-based word processor, I might be able to sort of illustrate that a little bit better in terms of how and why. Um, but basically, just today, upon conversion of all of the material that's found in the docx, it, the, the tables won't come in. Um, and, and 
in terms of the way that I know to get them to pull in, like if I take a JPEG, for example, of a table, I can place it as an image. I don't think this will be the state forever. In fact, I know that the community has agreed on an um, asset manager proposal, which is moving forward actually quite beautifully in the community. There are nice requirements and there's been a community call for comments. So I know that it's not long term, but that, that is today. Okay, I'm just wondering because from an accessibility standpoint, tables aren't readable that way. Um, right. So that would definitely be uh, something to consider. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And so we do have uh, an accessibility working group and there are multiple, you know, multiple reasons why. Because for example, we know the whole interface needs to be accessible as well mm -hmm. as the content that is exported. And we've worked with people like Bill Kasdorf to understand it and Benetech as well, uh, to understand better the issues surrounding accessibility and the things that we might need to consider as we, as we build the tool. And so we do have plans and we do have, as I say, uh, really a mandate from the accessibility work group to work with Benetech um, around this. So, uh, this editorial is, is iterative, as I'm sure you appreciate and know from working with Adam. So that what you see today is the point in time where we are. Okay, great to hear that it's uh, on your radar. Yep, thank you. Great question. Any more before I dive back in? Okay, back in I go. Um, so uh, the next thing that we can do then is to head into one of these chapters, which did come over from DocX and take a look. So I'm going to do this. I just click on the title. And now we're in WAX. And so WAX is the web-based word processor. We call it WAX because it's a Cocoa module. Uh, it's, it's, it is not Editoria, but it is, you know, integrated into Editoria. And just a note about WAX. So WAX was originally developed with uh, some open source uh, libraries uh, that had to do with the organization Substance. And Substance uh, had a community and, you know, uh, was a wonderful partner, but then sort of lost a little bit of that community feel. And so at the same time, I think some of the functionality we were expecting, such as better support for tables and other things, um, we decided to experiment with something called Prosmere, which is a similar open source library, and to basically rebuild Wax, rebuild what you're seeing here with the Prosmere library. And um, we found our, we have a developer that just works on Wax, and he has found that there's much more available. And when we do have the finalized version of Wax that is built with Prosmere, it will be uh, substantially more feature rich and, and friendlier, you know, to the table example. Um, and I, my sense is that that's not super far away, but the version that you're looking at now is the substance version of Wax for what that's worth. Um, but there are some UI things I'll point out first, just so that you kind of get your bearings on what you're looking at here. So you can always see where you are. This is like a signpost, right? You can see the specific book title that you're working on, as well as the chapter. And if, if I have a chapter title, right now I have, still have the file name that came in. Um, and that, that is intentional so that we can make sure everything comes in, but we can move away from it. And in fact, why don't I just do it? And you'll see that uh, automatically update. I see a chat message, so I'm going to be a little bit ADD and answer it, but more on wax. Oh, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. That's super helpful. Uh, okay. So now we can see that, that the signpost has updated. On either side of that, you see uh, other chapter names. If I click on them, I go immediately into the web-based word processor for that specific chapter. So this is a uh, response to a community item of feedback that was, you know, I, I don't like having to go back to the book builder every time when I'm working on a book, I just want to like keep working in wax. And so this is hopefully a friendlier UI now. And I can do the same in the other direction in terms of the immediate prior and the immediate following um, uh, chapters. So that is sort of what you see up there. In terms of the overall real estate, if I uh, go to full screen, you can see that I can really zoom in on the content. If I'm really in here, like I'm authoring or I'm editing, I can make sure that 
the focus is on the content rather than a, a bulky, and I'm not saying that it's bulky, um, navigation bar. So, and then, yeah, there are a number of uh, styles along this left-hand side. So what the conversion process did was to make a best guess about headings and stuff and, and the paragraph level styling. But, you know, it's, it's programmatic, so it's a, it is a best guess. And um, you can see here that we styled this specific uh, block of text as the title. The tool didn't do that itself. If I click into this, you can see that it's been uh, tagged as a heading two. And so again, you know, what we're seeing is sort of this, this representation, but behind the scenes is all the HTML. So as I'm going through and I'm updating the styles, I'm actually cleaning up the HTML, which will be used at export. So, so far, uh, you know, it's looking pretty good. I've got my, my general text correct, and then I can adjust my headings if I feel I need to and so on. Um, and so that's really the way that the styles work. I, I mentioned earlier that um, the component type was important to the styles. So right now you're seeing these styles, um, these specific styles, because this is a chapter. You wouldn't see these if, if this was designated as a part, for example. Or you wouldn't see these if it was designated as a front matter item, but you would see different ones that are specific to those component types. And all of that is totally configurable um, based on, you know, whatever your preferences are. But this is, um, it, the, the goal of all of this styling is just to make sure that the CSS can do its job really effectively. And so to that end, I can even add custom styles. Um, so for example, if I would need something that's like outside of the, the blanket um, standing group of styles that are in the deployment, I can always go ahead and add and, and then um, just, you know, target any of these as such. And that's going to, again, allow for the CSS to be more granular. If I pull up this note slider, you'll see that any of the notes that were found within the docx file have been placed here. And so there were a few notes. They all came over nicely. And then if I click on any of these um, note numbers, I'm brought right to the area of the text where uh, the, the corresponding uh, note callout occurs. So, and then, the, you know, the reverse is true. So if I were to come, I think I just saw it, come here and then click on that, you can see that my cursor is right in position immediately to edit, or maybe you can't because I'm uh, not scrolled down, but it, it goes right to note two, and note two kind of activates in the UI so that I can just set right about editing. And just one more thing about notes. So I can always add new notes, um, and when I do, everything subsequent is automatically renumbered, including any references to uh, any notes that are affected by the renumber. You don't have to worry about going through and updating all your note references. Um, and, and then my cursor is right in position to start adding my notes. So, and then again, this slider is handy because if you're not working on notes, you don't really care and you can just slide it down that way. Um, also on the UI, you can see um, I have some helpful, almost like dashboard type information, such as how many notes should be within the note slider, how many open comments there are, and we'll take a look at comments in a moment, how many track changes are active, Right now, none, but we can take a look. And then how many words? Now it's saying zero and you may be thinking, well, that doesn't work. There are clearly words in this uh, file, but if I highlight anything, you can see right away. And that's handy because you may not always want the full chapter word count. And if you do, you can just do a control A. But um, when, you, uh, when you only want to know, for example, you know, how many words are in this abstract, it's nice to be able to, to use it that way. Okay, so looking now instead of uh, at the styles and thinking instead about formatting options. So that's this toolbar here is where you're going to find all of those more formatting oriented options and track changes and stuff. So you can see I have undo redo, I can save although the system auto saves pretty frequently. Um, I have the ability to use transform cases. I um, I can do also uh, bold, italics, small caps, super and subscript, add in hyperlinks. I can add in bits of code and they show up, you know, set apart from, uh, from the text 
in sort of a highlighter fashion. Um, I can insert images, and I will do this because we talked about it earlier. So pretend this is a table, or you can accept it as an image, whatever you like, but this is the workflow uh, for that. So I basically just found a JPEG in my, in my directory. It would need to be pre-sized. Within Editoria today, there is no asset management. There's no digital tools to like size images or uh, color images or anything like that. But that is very much part of the asset manager proposal. So if you haven't already seen that and perhaps even weighed in on it yourself because it's open to everybody, please uh, check it out. And I can even send the link if, if you like after this. So um, in addition to placing the image, I can add in a caption. Captions can have uh, all kinds of formatting in them. They can have uh, line breaks. They can be uh, accessed by spell check and by find and replace. So they're very much part of the text, even though they're set aside in this way. Um, they are, they're treated 100% uh, basically the same as, as the body text. Um, one thing I point out about images is that, so right now I've just kind of dropped it there and it's sort of just in the middle. But you've probably already identified this is not the final output. And so obviously right now we're just prepping this content to uh, behave nicely at export with the CSS. So the CSS is going to define where this image goes and how it looks, and to a larger degree also the way that the caption appears. So, you know, don't get hung up on thinking, oh, well, you know, images should be at the top of the page, and that's not. It's just kind of like, well, we're just prepping it. We're giving the image to the HTML so that the CSS can, can do its thing with it. Um, okay, so that's images. We, we talked about notes and the inline note tool. This is the dynamic note uh, references tool. Um, we have the ability to add bulleted lists, numbered lists, to increase indentation of bullets or decrease. Very similar to in Word, many of these tools. A special characters tool, which allows you to insert um, foreign language symbols or math symbols. You can use search to find what you're looking for. Um, the ability to do find and replace, which again, it goes through the body text, the captions, the notes. It's totally through the whole file. Um, and, and you can both action find and replace. Um, we have a highlighter tool, but I'm going to show that to you in one second because I, um, I, have, I have a method in my mind here. I have the ability to add a content separator, which is useful to, for example, if you wanted to isolate or identify in the HTML a place where you wanted to put in an ornament and you had that all spelled out in the CSS, uh, this is just something that you can drop in and uh, make that separation in the code. Um, there's the ability to turn on or off a spelling and grammar check, as well as to define what language that you would prefer it to use. Um, and then we do have the ability to insert code blocks. Um, and then this tool, so I'm going to show you comments and highlighter in one moment. This tool would just help you to jump between uh, different comments, you know, uh, if, you're, if you're working through and trying to provide responses, for example, or resolve comments. Um, so this is to do with the ability, now we talked about custom styles and even custom components. Now we're going to talk about custom tags. So this is at the character level. I can create custom tags and then to turn them on I would use this button. And that is relevant because if I come down here and I do something like this, if this wasn't on, I wouldn't have the ability, for example, to even uh, interact with the custom tags. I just get my comment call to action. But when this is on, I can uh, either use an existing custom tag or I can um, add in a new custom tag. And again, that's really just, you know, telling, just adding a useful um, marker for the CSS to work with. So, um, so that's custom tag, we talked about this. And then, so this question mark is one um, useful item, which is a, lit, a menu of keyboard shortcuts. And they auto update according to what your operating system is. So whether you're using a Mac or a PC, you'll know how to action in the system using just the shortcuts, if that's how you like to work. Um, it's, it is useful for things like doing track change, actioning track changes that way. And so just really quickly, I'm gonna turn track changes on. I click that button right there. I apologize because I'm on a small laptop. Normally this is all on one line, okay? So, so this isn't like a error in the UI or, or anything like that. It's just that it's shrinking itself. And in fact, if I 
zoom out a little, you probably now can't see what's happening in the text, but that's, that's the way it, uh, the UI would look. So, um, so yeah, I can, with track changes on, I can make deletions and additions and, um, you can see that they're color coded, right? So everything that I've just done to alter the text is showing up in navy blue. That's because of my role. I'm an admin, and so admins and PEs have their changes showing up in navy blue. Copy editors have their changes showing up in orange, and authors have their changes showing up, I believe, in red. And so that also, I think, in the longer term will be configurable, so you can set your own preferences with regard to colors for this. Um, and in terms of actioning on track changes, there's a preview you can do just to see like, what would this look like if I accept all the changes? Um, and then, you know, obviously you would still have to go and either action on them one by one. You could use the keyboard shortcuts or these buttons. Um, you can also always do sort of like a bulk, just like you can in Word, accept or reject. Um, every time that I'm, I'm highlighting stuff, you can see that this comment bubble pops up. I'm just going to shut off my custom tags. Um, you can see that my comment bubble pops up and is inviting me to comment. Um, so when I do this, I'm logging the comment, much like in a Google Docs or Word environment. And then um, you know other users can come in and they can respond. And then you know you can build up the whole conversation and sort of this is the way it looks in the margin. And that is actually really why when you minimize the nav, you, you kind of get the full scope of with everything going on. It is, it is really nice to have more of that screen real estate to, you know, you've got a bunch of comments and conversations you want to work on. Um, and so the other useful element to this workflow is the highlighter tool that I mentioned. Um, so if I just like, highlight anything with the mouse, I can then apply highlighter to it. And the idea was that, you know, if you have multiple instances of the same type of thing, you're a copy editor and, you know, there's, there's a name that you're just not sure if it's accurate or something, you want somebody to double check it. You could highlight it in one of these colors and then just use one comment that says, is this correct? Instead of just comment, comment, commenting, all these redundant things. And especially because there are multiple colors, you could really, um, you know, you would use blue for certain types of queries um, you really um, have a lot of flexibility with that and you can also just turn it off too um, when you don't want it anymore you just uh, would highlight the same and get rid of it and the same is true with the comments so so now that I have one comment open I'm being alerted to it down here um, and then when I resolve it away it's just gone Allison um, does the yeah. tool store the history of changes like, can you look at previous versions of the document? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, I don't believe that it does today. And if perhaps I'm mistaken and it did, I can confirm that it's not, um, like, there's no way for you to access them. So if they're in the database somewhere, like, maybe, you know, they are stored, but they're not being surfaced to the user yet. So I do think in time, that's, I, I mean, the idea is really to make this a very robust sort of, like, true replacement for Google Docs, so all of these types of functions. But today, um, even if the database stores that information, it's not showing it. Okay. And can authors or people in other roles be working in the document at the same time? That is an excellent question, Karen. So they can't. Um, so when I'm in this file, I'm, I'm just going to save and actually go back to the book builder for a minute just to show you. Um, Okay, so you can see right here, usually um, if I'm in this, this button to you, if you're also, we're all in the same book, we're all looking at Book Builder. But if I'm in this file, the edit button to you will say view. And when you mouse over it, it will say that I'm in it. So you know who's in it um, and you know, uh, you know, you can always, an admin can actually always kick somebody out as well, but um, you know, that, that's how you would lose possibly changes. And that's why today, like concurrent editing is impossible in Editoria. And so we don't want to allow multiple accesses at the same time because that somebody's going to lose edits or additions or so on. Um, but what, so if, if you did click on the view, 
it is truly a read-only copy of the wax so you're going to see that same presentation you just saw you just won't be able to make changes but you can comment and those comments i believe do live so if if i'm in it and i'm editing and you leave a comment questioning something it might not show up right away for me but the next time i access it that comment should be in there um, and so that is sort of the extent to which everybody can always access the content. They just can't always make changes uh, more than one at a time. So, yeah, the next thing um, that I think I'll show, unless anyone has any wax, well, does anyone have any wax questions? No? Okay, so let's come up here. I know I mentioned I was setting uh, aside these two little buttons to talk about later, and this is later. So let's take a look at book settings. So what book settings is doing is it's allowing me to refine very specific running headers. Um, so for example, in the chapter that we were working on, you can see that it has my title, it's pulled it out of the document, and then it's just taken it and it's plopped it into both the left and right running head positions. Probably isn't what I wanna do. Um, so maybe on the left side, I can say, open, I don't want little caps, do I? Uh, open um, textbook network. So I've got my book title instead of my uh, chapter title there, and then I have my chapter title on the other side. So I can save this and move forward. And so that information will be useful when we move to export and we are uh, deciding sort of how we want to display uh, the, the content in terms of the format, but it will know this is the content that you have to display. And so in terms of export, um we have multiple options so when i click the export button i'm taken here and i i'm first asked whether i want to preview the content or i actually want to download it because it matters um, i'm either brought into like a view of the content or i'm brought into uh you know literally a place where i'm going to get something in my downloads folder so that's the first decision to make the next decision regardless is that i need to select a template because again, uh, everything in here, it's really just HTML under the hood and then we need to marry that HTML to the CSS to get anything useful. So we need to basically say which CSS uh, is gonna be used. And you might be wondering where the CSS is. Um, so up here, and I intentionally didn't show it to you when we were on the book dashboard because I didn't think it was the right time. But now it is, so um, when I click on templates, I have lots of CSS templates in here. And so these are all the templates for the whole deployment. And in order to export to any of them, I need to make the association at the book level. So there's no like default set up for your book. You have to go in and, and make that association. And you also have to make it per export format. So it does matter what template I have for EPUB versus what template I have for PDF versus what template I have for page JS. So I, I need, to, um, I need to, to be clear about that. For all of these templates, I can update them. So that means I can come in and like delete font files, upload new font files and so on. Um, or I can delete it completely, wipe it out of the template gallery. Or I can always add new ones. There's no limit to how many um, templates I can have. So now I'm gonna add an OTN template. And then, and um, let's say that it's for EPUB. Um, and then I'm gonna add the files. Okay, so. So these are all my files. I've got my CSS, but I've also got all of the font files that I need uh, it to reference. And then I can also add a cover image to help me identify it in the gallery, although this, you might have seen this gallery already. <laughs> um, and then it'll just be one minute. If the Verizon gods are still on our side here. Let's see. 
So Alice's okay. template gallery is really an opportunity for library publishers to potentially create their visual identity, their imprint, their brand, and have a consistent look and feel for their textbooks. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's no, you know, there's no limit to what you can do in terms of if you always want to use the same exact template, you could, but if you want to have um, different templates either for different outputs or for Are you there? We lost you, Allison. The Verizon gods may be going down for a nap. Well, Allison's cursor is frozen and I cannot hear her. So um, I'm just going to um, put a link in the chat of a book that I know that was recently published using Editoria. So you can take a look at the PDF and EPUB that Atla used um, for this particular publication, just so that you can see an example of a completed book. I think Allison's probably leaving and trying to come back. Um, are there any questions about what we've seen so far that you um, might wanna ask? I guess I'm not understanding if those templates are all CSS that you load from a site or if users can, must write their own CSS. That's a great question, Jonathan. Um, and I can confirm with Allison either when she gets back on the call or um, later via email. My sense is that um, there can be a few templates there for us. And then if you want to make your own and you have someone who knows CSS, you could upload your own. That would be my guess, but I'll confirm for you. Anyone else? I almost broke into song. Is anyone out there? Okay. Um, well, since there's only five minutes remaining in the hour and Allison uh, may have run out of uh, Wi-Fi power, I think I will adjourn the meeting and I will follow up with an email to all of you with the link to this video. And if you have additional questions, of course, let me know and I can um, get in touch with Allison. Matt, I do like the templates in the authoring platform, particularly track changes, pretty straightforward. Yeah, I think you know the advantages of Editoria is that it can be um, a, a place where you're working through the production workflow. It manages that whole process, not only the actual writing and publishing of a book. So thank you all for making time to come to this demo and happy Open Education Week and see you again soon. Bye.